good afternoon uh, friends today we will be discussing about uh, current concepts vertebro basilar artery disease uh, this is, it is uh, in posterior circulation posterior circulation stroke and vascular insufficiency that's what we are going to address the scheme of presentation will be we'll discuss briefly about the applied anatomy of the posterior circulation as relevant to the talk and we will discuss about the etiology and risk factors we will discuss the clinical features in the proximal middle and distal posterior circulation features we also discuss about large vessel occlusion small vessel occlusion that is the uh, uh, lacrimal strokes and chronic vertebro basilar deficiency we also would like to address on chronic vertebro basilar insufficiency what we call transient neurological attacks as opposed to TIAs in the uh, uh, other terminology for transient episodes these are different acute vertebral basilar insufficiency then we'll also discuss uh, the neuroanatomy of brain stem stroke syndromes which have relevance with posterior circulation we will discuss about diagnosis the current concepts in the treatment get the outcome and what are the preventive measures and most importantly for the uh, angiography interpretations we should know the anomaly the vertebral basilar circulation and their clinical uh, significance i'll show you some of the recent papers on topic which will be useful for uh, future reference so the vertebral arteries uh, arise from the right and uh, left subclavian arteries and travel crania through the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae and pierces the dura mater at foramen magnum to start their intracranial course both the vertebral arteries join at the pontomedullary medullary center to form the basilar artery there are four segments in vertebral artery the v1 segment which is from the origin to the foramen transversarium of uh, c6 or c7 vertebra v2 is from c6 to c2 vertebra v3 segment is the one that exits from uh, c2 that is axis vertebra and then arches behind the at last that is c1 enters the cranium the v4 is the distal most uh, segment intracranial so basilar artery is formed at the ponto medullary junction and travels ventrally on the pons and at ponto mesencephalic junction it bifurcates into the right and left posterior arteries the intracranial vertebral basilar system is divided into proximal middle and distal territories by dr kaplan in the new england medical center posterior circulation registry which is called nemcpcr and uh, the clinical features are uh, studied under these three headings also so you can look at the vertebral basilar artery which supplies the brain stem the medulla of the pons and the midbrain cerebellum the occipital lobes posterior temporal lobes and the thalamus on all these things are uh, uh, by the vertebral basilar system you can see that uh, these are vertebral arteries and the basilar artery the posterior cerebral artery the circle of valles and uh, you can see the medulla pons and midbrain and also cerebellum and occipital lobes it can be so so these are the areas which are supplied by the vertebral basilar system one second okay so next so you can see this is the uh, uh, overall picture the v1 segment you are seeing here and uh, from exit to the transfer foramen transfer stadium of uh, c6 then it ascends like this like this and it goes 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 on at v3 and it goes behind and at the medullary and pons junction it forms the basilar artery before that posterior inferior cerebral artery is given and then anterior inferior cerebral artery and their pontain perforators which are given and also the superior cerebral artery at the end and terminally it is divided into posterior cerebral artery so you've got uh, three territories proximal territory middle territory 
and the distal periphery. So the clinical features can be divided also in these three territories. And you can see the perforators which are visible here along the basilar artery. These are the vertebral artery, the basilar artery, and you can see the perforators which are uh, going on either side. And the lipohyalinosis changes or atherosclerotic changes in the perforators will give rise to lacunar infarcts. So very much uh, clear here the bifurcation into the posterior central artery on either side the point to note is there will be always a symmetry the, there are many anomalies in posterior circulation which we'll uh, see in about 11 to less 11 or 12 of them whether they have any clinical significance or not we'll see in the coming things so if you look at the strokes in the posterior circulation 20 percent of all ischemic strokes uh, they occur in posterior circulation we can define a posterior circulation stroke as the infarction occurring within the vascular territory supplied by the vertebro-basilar arterial system. And the, there are another concept that has emerged is that vertebro-basilar insufficiency. Whatever insignificant symptoms we thought earlier of no important uh, in health wise and we will give more importance after going through this class. Uh, and it is defined as a transitory ischemia of the vertebro basilar circulation by National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke NINDS. The ischemia of posterior circulation can result in vertebro basilar insufficiency or stroke. So, if you look at the strokes, they constitute about 20 to 40 percent of all strokes. It is defined, vertebro basilar stroke is defined as a symptomatic infarct in the vertebral, cerebellar, posterior cerebral or basilar artery as determined by CT or MRI. The vertebral basilar stroke or disease as we call or posterior circulation disease differs from the anterior circulation disease in clinical presentation, rapidity of development of symptoms, optimal imaging methods and also treatment. So there is a lot of difference between anterior circulation strokes and the posterior circulation strokes. The clinical presentation is in the form of a group of symptoms occurring at the same time usually. So the characteristic feature, a group of symptoms occurring at the same time. Uh, to look at this, Kubik and Adams described the clinical features of uh, vertebral basilar insufficiency back in 1946. These are dizziness, vertigo, headache, vomiting, diplopia, blindness, ataxia, imbalance and weakness on both sides of the body. So the VBI can also cause a standalone symptom of imbalance in 25% of elderly due to ischemia of the vestibular system secondary to the atherosclerosis of posterior circulation. So a standalone gait imbalance in elderly should caution us that there could be a vertebral basilar insufficiency. So now posterior cerebral artery disease presents mainly in two forms. Acute basilar artery occlusion which is rapid in onset must be diagnosed quickly and it is subject to endovascular treatment. Uh, okay. The other one is a chronic uh, which we will uh, uh, discuss later that is a chronic deficiency and the second one which is missing here is the chronic uh, vertebral basilar insufficiency. The acute basilar artery occlusion, apart from that, there will be acute posterior circulation strokes, which will give rise to various syndromes like uh, in midbrain, Weber's, Claude's, and Mullet Gubler syndrome, and we have North Angle syndrome, but we have for VLA syndrome. So all of them we are going to touch in the process of our lecture. So the etiology and risk factors, if you look, the posterior cerebral artery disease presents uh, as I said mainly in two forms, one of them is we have said the second one is chronic PCD or vestibular basilar insufficiency. These individuals present with insidious onset of uh, non-specific symptoms. So we often wonder sitting in OPD whether to give importance or not. So but these could be early warning symptoms and the signs of VBI it is said may antedate three weeks to three years prior to vertebral basilar insufficiency related stroke. So that's very surprising. Many cases of vertebral basilar disease remain undiagnosed or incorrectly diagnosed. The clinical features which develop slowly 
due to progressive occlusion of basilar and distal vertebral artery. The presentation of uh, posterior cerebral artery disease is initially non-specific, but symptoms progress very rapidly than in anterior circulation to produce a stroke. So there is a window period of opportunity where we can react. In approximately 46% of the stroke in PCA territory, recurrent TIAs are observed in preceding 90 days. It's an important point to know that recurrent TIAs will be observed in preceding 90 days in these cases where uh, PCA territory gives rise to stroke in about 46%. So etiology, the most common causes, if you look at uh, vertebral basilar insufficiency, are embolism from heart, aorta, proximal vertebral and basilar arteries. Second cause is large artery atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the most frequent cause, especially in men over 40 years. Here, hypertension, obesity, smoking are the main risk factors. The penetrating small artery disease due to lipohyalinotic changes, which will give rise to lacunar infarct. Then, most importantly, lacunar, the arterial dissections, and less frequent are migraine, fibromuscular dysplasia, coagulopathies, and drug abuse. We'll come back to this count classification once again after dealing with individual groups. So, the large vessel occlusion. So, if you look at the data from multiple stroke registries, and the, the etiology factors are uh, different and we'll uh, address them differently. First, we'll address about large vessel occlusion, which is atherosclerotic disease and uh, thromboembolism in 35%, small vessel disease 13%. And what is the common site? V1, the first segment and the last segment. Extracranial atherosclerosis also may coexist with coronary and the peripheral vascular disease. So if you find V1 is involved, then you also look for coronary and peripheral vascular disease. So what is V2 and V3? V2 and V3 segments are mainly involved in dissections. The steno to steno occlusive disease, secondary to embolism occurs most commonly in pica, distal basilar artery, superior cerebral artery and PCA branches. Most common intracranial site of atherosclerosis is the basilar artery followed by ICA, MCA, VA and PCA. There is a stenotic portion at the beginning of the vertebral artery, so cardiac emboli rarely reach posterior cerebral artery. The, there is a term called miserly perfusion. This is one what happens, what are the changes that take place. So the intracranial stenosis leads to reflex vasodilatation because of inadequate collateral circulation. Whenever there is an increase in cerebral blood volume, uh, so there is an increase in cerebral blood volume to preserve the normal cerebral blood flow. If because of stenosis, the CBF falls, the oxygen extraction fraction also increases. Failure of these compensatory mechanisms is known as misery perfusion and this is usually seen in case of a systemic hypotension. We will talk more about atherosclerosis. Atherosclerotic lesions predominantly involve proximal extracranial VA, as I said, V1, and intracranial VA and basilar artery, V4 and basilar artery, not V2 and V3. Atherosclerosis causes occlusive disease starting from the subclavian arteries, vertebral artery V1 segment, basilar artery, and also penetrating arteries. At the VA origin is often associated with atherosclerotic conclusions in the carotid, coronary and peripheral arteries as I have already mentioned a point to remember that it is there elsewhere also. So stenosis is common, I repeat again vertebral artery V1 segment and atherosclerosis in VA, V4 segment. Basilar artery occlusion is due to atherosclerosis mainly in 94% of the cases. What Kaplan and all observed is that in Asian black population women, they have more pronounced intracranial occlusive disease, whereas men have more of vertebral origin extracranial disease. So this is an observation which you may also like to test. So intracranial atherosclerosis branch disease, penetrating arteries which are arising from the basilar artery and posterior cerebral artery, they supply the brain stem and thalamus, they can also get involved. Hypertension, diabetes, both promote lipohalanotic changes in the small uh, 
penetrating arteries and microetheromas within these vessels can cause lack of nerve infarcts. Focal stenosis of the basilar artery, especially near the origin of the internal uh, uh, auditory, uh, auditory artery or the anterior inferior cerebellar artery or at the vertebral artery origin are common sites of uh, stenosis. So this uh, uh, atherosclerosis does not affect posterior cerebral arteries. They studied uh, Mark Webb et al. 2009, vertebral basilar stroke and recorded that 50% of vertebral artery and basilar artery stenosis was associated with multiple TIAS representation. That is, in case of vertebral basilar stroke, 22% as compared to the cerebral stroke, that is the cervical, uh, the anterior circulation stroke of 3%. So patients with low flow in posterior circulation have a significantly higher risk of stroke than those with normal flow. So the flow assessment in posterior circulation, which can be uh, done nowadays with uh, quantitative MRA, mm. which I'll um, briefly touch later, also be very useful because they are more likely to have stroke. Next. So the vascular stenosis in the uh, disease is a nominate two cases and subclavian five vertebral artery origin in 131 cases intracranial vertebral artery in 132 cases basilar artery 109 post artery 38 and pica is 14 aica is 2 super artery 10 in the dr kaplan's registry these are the numbers that are given for the vascular stenosis in um, that means in they, there is no sclerosis atherosclerosis here but these are stenosed they're liable to accumulate thrombi and cross occlusive disease and uh, the single artery involvement is known in subclavian artery vertebral artery origin intracranial vertebral artery basilar artery posterior cerebral artery pica and superior cerebral artery so these isolated single artery involvements are presented here the other uh, things are associated with uh, one or more branches of the posterior circulation so now look at the cardioembolism. What is important is cardioembolism. Cerebral blood flow distribution, if you look at the right side internal carotid artery, it about 40% of the blood flows through that. The left side intercerebral artery, 40% flows. In the posterior circulation, there is 20% of the blood flow that is coming out from the heart in the shape of cardiac output. So if you look at this, a fifth of the cardiac emboli may land upon posterior cerebral circulation, uh, maybe from mechanical prosthetic walls, atrial fibrillation, left atrial or ventricular thrombus, myocardial infarction if it happened within four weeks of the stroke, dilated cardiomyopathy, infective endocarditis, mitral stenosis without atrial fibrillation, bioprosthetic cardiac walls, hinges to heart failure, etc. So many causes, but one fifth of the cardiac emboli they may land up in posterior circulation. Another point to note is that uh, vertebrates are very small, often stenosed at the origin. So what, what happens? As a result, cardiac emboli cannot cross the stenosed part. And so thrombus associated with vertebral artery are more embolized distally than cardiac emboli. Cardiac emboli cross the stenosed part and cause in fox in the vascular territories of uh, PCA on their penetrating just to the main brain and thalamus, rostral, uh, basilar artery, superior cerebral artery, posterior inferior cerebral artery also can involve and cerebellum can also have infarcts. So the point to note is the vertebral arteries are small and are often stenose at origin. As a result, cardiac emboli cannot cross the stenose part and so thrombus associated with vertebral artery is more likely to embolize distally than cardiac emboli because they cannot cross. So vertebral artery thrombi beyond V1 they embolize distally. So right, the cardiac embolism, there are two registries which are always quoted, an EMCPC registry of Dr. Kaplan and Hallam Stroke Registry 591. So the embolism cardiac or artery to artery embolism of 
and uh, the ICC shows 11 percent of 591 cases and 477 plant registry has got more of cardiac or RT2 arterial embolism. If you look at the only cardiac, there are only 24 percent. The site is distal posterior circulation, middle posterior circulation. Whereas the other registry, it is a middle and a distal. So this is more common. And small vessel disease accounted for 33 percent in the helm stroke registry. So this is very important. So arterial dissection is common site is uh, V2 to V3. Uh, it's not V1. V1 is uh, stenosed and uh, V4 is atherosclerotic. So there are, there are, the arterial dissection can be spontaneous or uh, secondary to trauma. And usually seen in adults in 50% cases. There's always history of trauma, the neck manipulation. The characteristic clinical features are headache, neck pain. More than 90% in uh, Pica territory, they cause lateral medullary syndrome or cerebellar infarct. So whenever we come across cerebellar infarct or lateral medullary syndrome, it is mandatory for us to look for arterial dissection in this. So another important point is isolated neck pain or headache without ischemic symptoms is seen in 12% of the dissect dissections. So these cases which we may consider as benign now kindly have a look and rule out the dissections when compared to arterial dissections in the anterior circulation uh, in cervical dissection the neck pain cerebral hemorrhage are more common and take longer time to diagnose the etiology of uh, less common factors is subclavian steel syndrome jain cell arthritis fabry disease melas migraine press in RCVS, they all cause the posture circulation features. Now we'll go on to the third aspect that is clinical features and the most frequency of symptoms if you look at that the symptoms and signs which are, we observe are vertigo indigenous. This always confuses us in the uh, MI room or in the emergency whether we should uh, uh, really look at this vertigo seriously or is it benign. So one clue is if there are vascular risk factors, we should give importance and rule out stroke if the patient is above 50 years. Dysarthria, weakness, abnormal gait, as I said, 25% of elderly have imbalance in gait only with vertebrobasilar insufficiency. Diplopia, headache, memory loss, face numbness, nausea, vomiting, decreased alertness, transient loss of vision. These are the symptoms and uh, signs, dysmetria. 40 percent ataxia 31 face weakness nystagmus sensory loss babinski sign arm paresis leg paresis visual field effects Horner syndrome and facial hypologies here these are the important signs that are encountered so the pca territory clinical features can be discussed like this unilateral and bilateral the unilateral of pca transposable artery for occipital lobe infarction is there there will be control at harmony hemianopia with macular sparing if it is a dominant occipital lobe as spinning of corpus callosum we all know that it was just x here agraphia and there is also harmony hemianopia the ventral occipital cortex that is infracalcarine that is the what pathway is a chromatopsia loss color differentiation Contralateral to the side of the lesion can be associated with a quadrantanopy. The optic radiation or supracalcarine that is a wear pathway that is inferior quadrantanopsia. Mayer's loop, temporal lobe or infracalcarine that is also superior quadrantanopsia. If there is bilateral option, there will be cortical blindness and uh, bilateral cortical blindness with normal ophthalmological findings. Anton syndrome is client particle blindness with denial of blindness and confabulations are visual hallucinations. So there is a Bennett syndrome with optic, uh, uh, optic uh, ocular apraxia and simultaneous The PCA, that is middle cell artery and post cell artery border zones also can get involved in ischemia, ventral, occipital, temporal.
uh, what part is the prognosia that is the fusiform face in the world inability to recognize familiar faces and or interpret facial expressions the retentive with speech and unique features so you will help them to identify with bilateral occipital parietal the uh, an inability to reach the targets with the visual guidance kilometer apraxia Uh, in a left left parietal temporal burden causes transcortical sensory aphasia that is impaired comprehension fluid speech but preserved repetition so repetition is preserved so these are the important syndromes for the pca mca border jones very important for us to remember them next the posterior inferior cerebellar artery that we all know that is the wallenbach syndrome and it causes vertigo nausea vomiting ipsilate facial numbness dysmetry of hand syndrome dysphagia ataxia dysphonia and contract hemisensory loss below the face but there is no motor weakness and it involves inferior posterior cerebellar hemisphere inferior vermin and left medulla cerebellar artery involvement causes dorsolateral upper brain stem and cerebellum and superior cerebellar peduncle involvement this is called superior cerebellar artery syndrome then you have ipsilateral limb ataxia or tegon nystagmus dysarthria and gait ataxia anterior inferior cerebellar artery causes ipsilateral labyrinth lateral pontine tegmentum and brachium pontis involvement and the lateral pontine syndrome it is called ipsilateral dysmetria hearing loss horner syndrome and periform dyskinesias contralateral thermoanalgesias so there are kind some characteristic features when the pca territory Uh, is uh, in the uh, branches and wall. One of the important is the top of the basilar artery syndrome, which will affect the midbrain thalamus and mesial temporal lobes, occipital lobes. It's a very serious condition. Cremas, somnal lens, pedunculate hallucinations, convergence, nystagmus, skew deviation, oscillatory eye movements. That is retraction and elevation of the eyelids, which is called Collier sign, vertical gaze paralysis. The mid basilar artery. the lateral and medial pons the lateral mid pontine syndrome causes ipsilateral loss of facial sensation motor function of the trigeminal nerve ipsilateral dysmetria because there is no uh, cortical fibers here the mid pontine syndrome ipsilateral dysmetria contralateral arm and vagueness and this division is seen so laterally there is no weakness pontine paramedian penetrators that is antero medial pons this is a dorsal pontine syndrome so we have seen lateral mid pontine medial mid pontine and dorsal mid pontine where you got ipsilateral facial palsy horizontal gaze palsy because parapontine reticular formation is involved and contralateral arm and leg weakness so these are the syndromes and the common clinical features if uh, both the registries which have documented them if you compare them you see the percentage of dizziness and vertigo is more in the uh, second registry ipc sq and dysarthria is more nausea or vomiting loss or altered sensorium limb weakness ataxia and nystagmus so the documentation of the clinical features is very important and this disease to be suspected when a combination of symptoms are present when a combination of signs are present and as i said all the three registries signs and symptoms are documented but the point to note is look for ataxia look for facial lingual palsy in nystagmus dysarthria and focal weakness in the signs and in the symptoms look for vertigo dizziness headache nausea vomiting disturbed consciousness any combination of more than one or two should always make us suspect vertebral basilar insufficiency of disease and the percentages are given here 
so the posture circulation the vascular territory and see we, most of the uh, that is intracranial vertebral artery we can again side contralaterally the design sota syndrome that is a medial medullary because pyramidal tract and medial lemniscus and hypoglossal sometimes can be involved so the it causes brachiocural hemiparesis hemi body loss of uh, proprioception and tongue weakness and atrophy and lateral medullary syndrome wellenberg syndrome it is also possible and it has got features contralateral hemisensory loss pain and temperature below the and the spinothalamic tract is involved so simply posterior inferior cerebral artery and as you can see the depend where the uh, infarct region is there is it lateral medullary infarct is it medial medullary infarct if it is medially situated it is the uh, medial lemniscus is involved if it is ventrally situated the pyramidal tract as well as medial lemniscus involved if it is laterally and dorsally situated it is more of sensory uh, ganglion those are involved posterior inferior cerebral artery may involve cerebellar region also, and that may cause labyrinthine vertigo syndrome where you have gait attacks uh, truncal electropulsion limb coordination so the middle intracranial posterior circulation can be involved where proximal artery and the that is uh, the cyclopyrifluidal uh, in syndrome one is locked syndrome importantly and then inferior ventral pontian syndrome inferior medial pontian syndrome ventral mid pontian syndrome which we have already referred to and mid mid pontian syndrome so these will give to various combination of facial paralysis gauge paralysis because of the involvement of parapontian reticular formation dysarthria tongue and weakness there will be quadriparesis or uh, maybe in some condition weakness the there is a uh, in a lower motor neuron facial uh, palsy a picture like uh, millet gubler along with absence of palsy the inferior medial pontian will have hemisensory loss internuclear ophthalmoplegia also because of the medial longitudinal fasciculus and in, in cases of uh, sometimes the cerebellar attacks yes are also then dysmetria on leg ventrally as i said is most motor arm and leg weakness because cortical spinal tracts are involved so the tegmental midpontian syndrome or grant syndrome involves spinal tracts posterior columns and their nucleus as a result you got a hemisensory loss of pain temperature hemi body loss of tactile or proprioception and global anesthesia or thermal analgesia of the face sometimes uh, paralysis of masticate muscle see this is the intracranial lastly the distal intracranial posterior circulation which is very important that is the top of the basilar artery syndrome and it can cause at the side is bilateral with somnolence visual hallucinations dream like behavior vertical gaze paralysis there will be cortical blindness because of occipital low involvement Balanit syndrome with optic ataxia, loss of voluntary but not reflex eye movement, simultagnosia, and amnestic dysfunction, agitated behavior, and ocular apraxia. Also, because the ascending reticular activating system is involved, superior colliculi and temporal and occipital lobes of both sides are involved. It's a very, very uh, severe condition. The mesencephalic dorsal tegmental syndrome or Mill syndrome. Where it is uh, basically because of superior cerebral artery involvement, there will be contralateral or ipsilateral limb ataxia, contralaterally analgesia of the face, arm, trunk, and leg because of the involvement of the superior middle cerebral peduncles. The middle cerebral peduncle is carrying corticopontian fibers. The superior cerebral peduncle is taking the efferent pathway, and this is also there is involvement of superior cerebral artery hemisphere in the superior cerebral artery and spinothalamic tracts are also involved in this syndrome there is a ventral mesencephalic syndrome or weber syndrome which we know 
third nerve nucleus on one side and contralateral hemiparesis because the corticospinal tracts and oculomotor nerve fascicles are involved. And design rosy syndrome is a posterior cerebral artery that is a thalamic pain syndrome, contralateral hemisensory loss of a superficial and deep sensation and heavy body pain because of the posterior inferior thalamus involvement. Unilateral PCA, contralateral hominomous hemianopia with macular sparing because of the occipital cortex involvement and achromatopsia is ventral occipital cortex, alexia without agraphia, dominant occipital lobe plus splenium of the corpus callosum is also involved. Bilateral PCA syndromes cause anthem syndrome that is cortical blindness where both uh, occipital lobes are involved patient is not aware of his blindness and denies blindness he confabulates a lot and there are visual hallucinations there are bottled low zone pca mca we have already read about it presopognosia bernard syndrome transcortical sensory aphasia this table will you give you the whole all the three tables will summarize all the findings of the posterior circulation so there are some differentiating features when attack is presenting symptom where in emergency conditions, we are always asked to decide whether there is any uh, intervention to be planned, like endovascular treatment, etc. So, if you look at the peripheral causes, the onset is acute here also, and central also it is acute. But in periphery, it can be gradual. In central, it's always acute. Minutes to hours in peripheral cause, and in central cause, it can last days to weeks. Impact of head movement worsens when in peripheral it's variable in central auditory symptoms are frequent in the peripheral causes central they are absent dick's halipack is positive this maneuver in peripheral vertigo and it is negative in central associated neurological findings are only encountered in the central causes so the nystagmus also similarly we have to die, see whether it is ventral peripheral or central in the peripheral it is unidirectional and in central it can be alternating the direction of the first phase the first phase usually goes to unaffected side and a corrective circuit brings it back the vertical component is absent in the peripheral but it can be present in central fatigable in 30 to 60 seconds in the peripheral of uh, nystagmus but central nystagmus are not fatigable at all there may be associated vertigo in central nist in the peripheral nystagmus but it can be absent in central nystagmus there will be no vertigo these are the important differentiating features of a peripheral and central originated nystagmus another important thing is ataxia so this is the uh, main features of the posterior cerebral circulation what you can remember is the differentiating features of peripheral and central origin of the vertigo nystagmus ataxia and in addition there is headache or not so gait ataxia is present but less severe that is very severe truncal ataxia is common in central cerebellar testing is frequently abnormal in central which is normal in periphery acute or gradual as i said earlier also in uh, periphery but is acute in the central like less likely to be severe at the onset in peripheral but more likely to be very severe at onset in central causes and headache is common in central causes the location and as occipital usually in central causes and commonly unilateral and typically at the time of other symptoms the headache is present so but that's not the case in the peripheral causes this is the hints and head impulse test the abnormal gauge correction you see the correct second in cases of peripheral vertigo it's not seen in case of a central nystagmus first phase in one direction first phase in alternating directions in central test of skew skew is absent in peripheral skewing is spent in the central so these are the important uh, things this is going to hints so head impulse test is uh, normal on both sides in brainstem or cerebellar lesions but abnormal on one side in peripheral vestibular lesion there is a correct saccade comes Nystagmus is alternating, as I said in the previous slide, first phase alternating directions, whereas in peripheral vestibular lesions it is directional horizontal nystagmus which increases in intensity with gauge toward the first phase. 
and skew deviation is absent in the peripheral. So the revision is over for int test, very, very important. Now look at the vertebral vessular deficiency or a large vessel occlusion and small vessel occlusion, how they present. If you look at the pre-communication part of the PCA, there will be contralateral sensory loss because of thalamus involvement, cognitive dysfunction, thalamic aphasia, visual dysfunction as for the posterior post-communicating segment. So this is a revision which we said, but we are just again revising the posterior artery features in the pre-communication part. And uh, next is the artery of Percheron. The artery of Percheron, as you can see, then the origin of the one single artery which supplies both the thalami, that is uh, the artery of Percheron. And uh, you can see the posterior communicating artery, the normal position, two stems uh, from P1, they come and multiple uh, perforators will come, posterior communicating artery is there and see the single, this is the artery of Percheron which can give rise to bilateral thalamic infarct as you can see and there is a differential diagnosis for this feature on the uh, imaging so it has to be suspected, artery of Percheron infarction and large vessel clinical syndromes, again I will come back to artery of Percheron again. Uh, the posterior pica syndrome is Horner syndrome, epsilon hemi ataxia, epsilon parietal weakness, hoarseness of voice and decreased pain and temperature sensation on the ipsilateral portion of the face and contralateral limbs. Very easy to remember these are the large vessel clinical syndromes which are seen in posterior circulation and next is Just give me a bit. Right. Anterior inferior cerebral artery, which we are revising again, there will be ipsilateral deafness, ipsilateral facial weakness, ipsilateral hemiaxia, horse voice, and ultralateral sensory loss in the limbs because of the cross spinal features. Superior cerebral artery, ipsilateral ataxia, decreased sensation contralaterally, and diplopia. So these are the salient features of large vessel syndromes. If you look at the basilar perforators, median and paramedian potent perforators, you got contralateral limb weakness, if unilateral, quadriperses, but it is bi. fibers bring back the information to cerebellum from the cortex which is again crossed that is cortico ponto cerebellar tract which so the double crossing takes place so that's why hemi attacks on the same side in the process you can get sixth and seventh nerve can get affected at the nuclear or fascicular levels and because of the involvement of the internuclear i mean um, there will be internuclear ophthalmoplegia because MLF is involved. MLF is coming from the sixth nerve parapontian reticular formation and it is going to the third nerve nuclei in the midbrain. Uh, midbrain, basilar, posterior cerebral artery, prefer craters. What do they cause? If there is an occlusion or lipohyalinotic changes, they cause ipsilateral third nerve palsy, contralateral facial arm leg weakness, a corticospinal tract, maybe a rubral tremor or proximal tremor because of red nucleus involvement and attacks because of the dexation of the superior cerebellar ankle. Anterior spinal artery and vertebral artery perforators to median and paramedian middle nerve will involve the tongue. The ipsilateral tongue weakness that is uh, hypoglossal nerve nucleus and nerve fibers and contralateral arm and legs that reduce vibration sensation and pure because of medial laminiscus involvement and contralateral arm and leg weakness because of the medullary pyramid. So these are the large vessel syndromes and let us define the lacuna syndrome. There are small ischemic infarctions in the deep regions of the brain or brainstem. The diameter is 0.5 to 15 millimeters, 1.5 centimeters. The results from the occlusion of the penetrating arteries. The common syndromes are pure motor hemiparesis, pure sensory stroke, sensory motor stroke, dysarthria, clumsy hand syndrome, and ataxic hemiparesis. So these are the characteristic syndromes which one should remember. Pure motor hemiparesis, pure sensory stroke, 
sensory motor stroke, dysarthria, clumsy hand syndrome, and ataxic hemiparesis. I'll show you the imaging walls. So the lacunar syndromes, pure motor hemiparesis can be localized to the infarct that is situated on the internal capsule, basis pontis coronary radiator, contralateral hemiparesis or hemiplegia, which involves the face, arm to lesser extent the legs with dysarthria is seen in these cases. The ventral postulateral nucleus of thalamus is involved, then you get a pure sensory stroke. Internal capsule and thalamus involvement will be sensory motor stroke. Posterior limb of the internal capsule and basis pontis attacks hemiparesis. A deep areas of basis pontis is causes dysarthria, clumsy hand syndrome. So this is the uh, uh, rough idea you have a middle cerebral artery uh, supplying the internal capsule, the superior part on both sides, the anterior cerebral artery in the inferior part anteriorly, and the anterior choroidal artery of internal carotid artery origin, and posterior choroidal artery supplies the posterior limb inferior. So remember this picture for the blood supply of the internal capsules, anterior limb is triad branches of the anterior cerebral artery, the posterior limb medial and lateral striated branches of the middle cerebral artery, which is one of them is Charcot's artery. The genu is cup supplied by anterior cerebral artery straight branches, sublentiform, the central branches of the anterior parietal artery, the retrolentiform, posterolateral branches of the posterior cerebral artery. This is a blood supply. So there is something called a capsular warning syndrome, which is a rare clinical syndrome, which is defined as recurrent transient lacunar syndrome. Crescendo episodes of ischemia, they are restricted to the region of the internal capsule. They cause symptoms affecting face, arm, and leg. The ischemia was more often due to hemodynamic phenomena in disease, single, small, penetrating vessel. So it's very difficult to treat and it does not amenable for any treatments. That brings us to chronic vertebral basal insufficiency acute vestibular base for insufficiency and what we call as transient neurological attacks are TNAs. So atherosclerosis at origin we have already discussed the vertebral artery in the neck. This, it causes brief TAS of dizziness, difficulty focusing visually and loss of balance. These are precipitated by maneuvers that reduce blood pressure or blood flow that cause ischemia of the vertebral base structures in the medulla and cerebellum. The intracranial vertebral artery bilaterally, if there is occluded, there will be multiple brief episodes of dizziness, veering, perioral paresthesias, and diplopia. We keep getting these cases. Following symptoms are referable to systemic, circulating, vestibular, and oral origin, or often they are falsely attributed to the posterior circulation ischemia. What are they? They are isolated attacks of dizziness, lightheadedness, or vertigo. Uh, dizziness is often referring to lightheadedness, uh, a lack of mental clarity or frank vertigo. There is a confusion about the term dizziness and vertigo. One has to sit down with the patient and understand what he is telling. Vertigo indicates dysfunction of the peripheral vestibular or central vestibular and cerebellar system. The peripheral vestibulopathy is triggered by sudden movements, postural changes, and it is commonly associated with oral symptoms. Whereas the central vertigo can cause transient attacks of attacks and uh, occlusion of the branch of the AIC or anterior infestible artery, the basal or, or the artery supplying the inner ear. The diabetics can cause vertigo, unilateral hearing loss, or both before causing a brainstem infarction. That means you have a TAA and then an infant. However, isolated at attacks lasting more than three weeks are not to be considered as vertigo basal insufficiency. They are local causes for it. So now let us look at the dizziness in the vertebral basilar insufficiency, which has got the following characteristics. And we'll, uh, we'll remember them. Sudden digi spell lasting 30 seconds to 15 minutes, especially after standing up or turning in a bed. This is a vertebral basilar insufficiency. No positional relationship, no hearing loss, tinnitus, or oral fullness. Other cranial nerve dysfunction, especially visual symptoms may be present. There may be episodes of vertigo, which is short lasting and waning within dates or months and month, minutes to dates or months. These episodes keep coming for minutes. In the Wellenberg syndrome of the pica territory, ischemia, dizziness, associated dysphagia, hoarseness, 
and nausea, vomiting, nystagmus, and gait imbalance. Uh, what are these uh, transient uh, loss of consciousness? Whenever that comes, is it vertebral basilar insufficiency or is it something else? We will discuss it. A transient decrease in consciousness. Seizures and syncope are uh, much more of causes of temporary loss of consciousness than cerebrovascular disease. The reticular activating system promotes wakefulness and it is located in the paramedian tegmentum of the upper brain stem. The basilar artery occlusion always interrupts the functioning of a particular activating system and causes coma, but with ocular motor, motor signs also probably present. So carefully look for these eye signs. There is a term called drop attacks. A drop attack is defined as a sudden loss of postural tone and falling without warning. If loss of consciousness does not accompany the seizure syncope, it is not due to PCA territory ischemia. So, you know, the important thing is that PCA ischemia is a rare cause of drop attack. Brainstem ischemia can affect corticospinal tract and they present with persistent motor weakness in association with other features of brainstem or cerebellar dysfunction. That means insufficiency. So, lightheadedness is a pre syncope secondary to circulatory systemic or cardiac disease, as I already said. It's rarely a manifestation of vertebral basilar ischemia. The diagnostic yield with vascular imaging for isolated syncope is exceptionally for the neuroimaging is very low. So it is it is better to concentrate on cardiac causes. Chronic vestibular basilar insufficiency may be seen in vestibular basilar artery stenosis. Uh, it may present with recurrent TIAs in the preceding one month before the stroke or uh, may remain asymptomatic till the stroke. In case of uh, basilar, art basilar artery occlusion due to thrombus, there is a collateral circulation. If that is sufficient to produce a um, hyperperfusion, then the disturbed cellular function uh, may persist, but there is no cell death in this case. So the complete B occlusion may take 2 to 35 days, but the disturbed cellular function will give rise to some symptomatology. So hypotension, hypoperfusion in the posterior circulation disease, what we call occlusive disease, manifests as transient, brief spells of dizziness, vertigo, visual blurring, and ataxia. Due to reconstitution of extracranial vertebral for the posterior circulation or MR angiography or if required could be the DSA. So the, what are the TNAs, transient neurological attacks? These are the symptoms that may precede a vertebral basilar stroke in preceding 90 days. In a study of 275 patients with the vertebral basilar stroke, 59 patients had TNAs and stroke only 10 sought medical attention. So that means out of 59, they had stroke and TNA, but only 10 of them came for help. So the TNA is observed in this group are isolated vertigo, vertigo with non-focal symptoms, isolated double vision, binocular visual disturbances, transient generalized weakness and dysarthria. So whenever we encounter these, we have to be very careful. So after 50 years, all these symptoms will make us wise and help us do the vascular imaging of the posterior circulation. The acute vertebral basilar stroke is a most frequent symptom is dizziness and uh, visual symptoms predominate that is diplopia, visual hallucinations, visual field defects and vision loss. Sudden loss of tone in the lower limbs leading to fall without losing consciousness in coordination, weakness, that means isolated drop attacks are not, they are associated with visual symptoms and dizziness. Less frequently, confusion, headache, hearing loss, paresthesias, dysarthria, sentinitis, which will make us confused and uh, decide that the, the thing could be peripheral. But confusion should not be there and visual symptoms should not be there. The most common signs is peripheral nystagmus in 50% cases. So again, another confusing features, but you have to be clinically 
alert to the possibility of central cause. Vertebral basilar deprivation nystagmus is one thing which you can test. How do you test this? This nystagmus is obtained by extension and rotation of the neck for three minutes. It indicates vertebral basilar insufficiency when other etiologies were ruled out. Head rotation causes decrease in the blood flow in the opposite vertebral artery and the resultant acute ischemia depolarizes the cilia in the inner ear and generate nystagmus. So that's a vertebral basilar deprivation nystagmus, a term which you should all keep in mind and do this test. It is nystagmus should be obtained by extension and rotation of the neck for three minutes. The clinical features depend on the location. The intracranial vertebral artery occlusive disease causes lateral medullary and hemimedullary infarcts, basilar occlusion, bilateral pontine infarcts, distal basilar and penetrating arteries before they take off. They cause unilateral basilar tegmental pontine infarct, which we have seen when affect the upper cerebellum, midbrain, thalamus, and PC arteries, and at times the top of the basilar artery infarcts. The intrinsic atherosclerosis of the posterior artery is uncommon. PCA infarcts are embolic from artery to artery more often than heart because the posterior artery is small. So a thorough cardiac evaluation is mandatory in all PCAs of posterior artery infarcts. But uh, posterior cerebral circuit, lipohyaline is penetrating branches of pons causes hemiplasia in the peripheral branches, thalamogenuclear branches, or stroke. The cerebellar infarct, dizziness in conjunction with frank vertigo, blurred vision, gait problem, a vomiting, veering to one side, not spread, cannot stand without support, ipsilateral hypotonia, nystagmus, no hemiparesis or hemisensory loss. The PCA infarct, posterior cerebral artery infarct, causes hemianopia of the contralateral visual field with sparing of the macula. Ipsilateral to hemianopia, there are hemisensory symptoms also. If it is a left PCA infarct, there may be erection, color anomia. In the case of right PCA infarct, neglect of the left visual field and disorientation to place. Bilateral PCA infarcts, as we have already seen, bilateral visual field defects, cortical blindness, inability to make new memories and an agitated state. The most severest of all, top of the basilar syndrome, infarction of rostral midbrain and thalamus, signal length stupor, inability to make new memories. Small, poor reactive pupils, defective wet gaze or up gaze, palsy, skewed deviation of the arts. So, the Wallenberg syndrome, the penetrating artery, the thalamic lacunar artery, basilar artery thrombosis, atherosclerotic closure of the basilar artery, arterial dissections, these are the important clinical presentations. The Wallenberg syndrome, we will have to repeat again. The penetrating artery disease of paramedian pons, we have already done. Thalamic lacunar infarct causes pure sensory strokes. The basilar artery thrombosis and some symptoms of all causes of beta thrombosis will progress over days to include a combination of motor features, weakness in more than one and up to four limbs, sensory loss of the face, cranial nerve dysfunction, cerebral dysfunction, nystagmus, and incoordination. At times, Patients with extensive occlusion of basilar artery can survive with minimal or no symptoms because of the, the luxurious collateral circulation. Uh, the atherosclerotic occlusion, there are bilateral symptoms and signs or crossed findings on one side of the face, contralateral hemiparesis, third nerve palsy. At times, there may be locked in syndrome. The, again, a repetition of arterial dissection because of its importance. The cardinal symptom is pain that is most often. Uh, in the posterior part of the neck or occiput radiating to the shoulder, occipital or diffuse headache. There may be accompaniments in the form of dizziness, diplopia and features of lateral medullary or cerebellar infarct. Uh, one important point is intracranial vertebral artery dissections cause medullary pontine and cerebellar ischemia. They also can cause subacronoid sub hemorrhage. So a 57 year old man with hypertension, high cholesterol levels, and angina pectoris awoke one morning and could not see to his left. During the preceding weeks, he had several brief attacks of dizziness 
accompanied by difficulty focusing his eyes. During one spell, his body veered to the right. These are the important history points and we can do some help only at this stage. Examination showed left homonymous hemi anopia. A long high-pitched bruise was had on the right supraclavicular region. The angiogram showed extracranial vertebral artery occlusive disease. Vertebral artery occlusive disease. And an embolus from the vertebral artery had migrated to the basilar artery to occlude the right posterior cerebral artery. The MRI shows this infarction. So this type of cases which we get, and this is again enlarged version of the same. So the important thing to remember, if you group them into corticospinal, limb weakness, hyperreflexia, extensor plantar responses, corticobulbar, facial weakness, dysarthria, dysphasia, increased back reflex because of the lower cranial nerve, corticobulbar fibers affliction, and oculomotor fibers affliction causes diplopia, gauge palsies, nystagmus, and internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and reticular activating system involvement causes reduced consciousness. These are the visceral artery occlusion features, and they are first described, you can see, in about uh, uh, very, very you know, early in the by. 1946 June uh, by Kubik and Raymond Adams. So this is an important uh, paper which you can, uh, if you are interested in history, you can read. I'll show some more important fab. So these are the occlusion things which they have noted and documented the infarct areas in the basilar artery occlusion. Thrombosis, first day, sudden onset of paresthesia on one side. Second day, unsteady gait and diplopia. Later drowsiness, stupor, ptosis, unequal pupils, paralysis of conjugate gaze, dysarthria, bilateral extensions are dental reflexes. Third to sixth day improve. Again, seventh day parasitogenesis, anarthria, quadriplegia, and coma, eighth day death. This is a case described in 1946. And when have they demonstrated the thrombosis in the basilar artery? That is the case which is. Uh, which makes it very interesting to know. So, sudden onset of dizziness. So, the second case, nausea and vomiting. You can see the infarct area. Three hours later, there is a deep stupor, anarthia, divergent strabismus, left hemiplegia, extensor plantars bilaterally, and two days, one and a half to two days, quadriplegic, tonic convulsion, extension of all four limbs, deep coma, temperature high, and death. So, bilateral constricted pupils. Hyperreflexia, deep coma, that is the pontine region. So that brings us with the brainstem vascular syndromes of midbrain, pons, and medulla, which are named. These are Weber's, Benedict's, Claude's, Mangales in the midbrain, Millet Gubler and Fowley in the pontine, ventral pontine syndrome, Mary Foix, Wellenberg, Dijon Sota syndrome. These are the midbrain syndromes. If you look at the midbrain, uh, without the crust cerebri, the substantia nigra, red nucleus. Ascending trigeminal tract, medial lemniscus, oculomora nucleus, and the aqueduct you can see here. And the, this is the aqueduct. I'll change the color of this. Right. And, uh, this so, this is the aqueduct and the medial lemniscus. This is the aqueduct. So, you can divide into A, B, C, and D. Antero medial is this. Antero lateral is this. Lateral is C. And D is dorsal, this is a ventral. Ventral, you see, this is a posterior cerebral artery territory. And you get gait ataxia, limb ataxia, dysarthria, sensory symptoms, third nerve palsy, and left hemiparesism. So these are the important features. And you can see the re region of the infarct in the MRI and the corresponding remembrance where various parts are there in the midbrain is shown here. Wellenberg syndrome, and we have been studying uh, sorry, Weber syndrome. You see the fascicle third nerve are involved, which is coming from this side. This is the third nerve. In contralateral hemiparesis due to the cerebral peduncle involvement, ipsilateral third, that is fascicles, and impaired ipsilateral pupillary reflex and dilated pupil, all because of the third nerve parasympathetic uh, fiber affliction. The second midbrain one is Benedict syndrome, 
and the perforators are involved usually the midbrain tegmentum is involved and uh, ipsilateral cranial nerve third a palsy with the dilated pupils that is also because of the fascicular involvement contralateral involuntary movements because red nucleus is involved and also substantia subthalamic nucleus is also involved so this is the benedict syndrome which has got contralateral involuntary movements with third nerve and clot syndrome is a again pca perforators midbrain tegmentum that is the dorsal aspect is involved and you have ipsilateral third nerve palsy and this is the third nerve and you got a contralateral hemiataxia and dysmetria due to involvement of the dentated thalamic fibers in the superior cerebral peduncles and you have the red nucleus involvement giving rise to contralateral red tremor nathangel is the fourth syndrome of the midbrain and also same pca perforators and the midbrain ipsilateral third nerve contralateral hemiataxia because of the dentated thalamic fibers in the superior cerebellar peduncle which is seen here so that is midbrain now we look at the pontine infarcts which uh, are, uh, are not above the pontine infarcts uh, sorry uh, it's my fault so you can see the pontine infarcts which are here basically the pontine infarcts so these are pontine infarcts they cause coma quadriparesis sensory loss gaze palsy and locked in syndrome maybe branch occlusion or artery artery embolism you can see the various uh, morphologies of these infarcts and the vascular anomalies and you can see the stenosis of the vascular artery the unilateral pontine base infarction uh, is this is the result of that here and uh, uh, after the treatment then they can then maybe vascular artery occlusion 40% of the cases is seen this is a dysarthria clumsy hand syndrome which is the lacunar syndrome which is a pontine base infarction you can see the pontine base infarction here and here the involvement is because of the corticospinal tracts and the corticobulbar tracts then this is called dysarthria and clumsy hand syndrome so the pons uh, then the retro uh, you can saw the uh, what you call the the, the part of the pons that is uh, the, a, the rostral part and uh, that causes dysarthria and hemiparesis because the involvement of the corticospinal tract and the corticobulbar fibers you can see the lesion here and uh, this is the lesion of the uh, this which is causing dysarthria and attacks uh, hemiparesis so these are the, this is the pons and the basilar artery and these are so many perforators which are coming and lipohalonotic changes in this uh, because of the diabetes and hypertension will cause small infarcts because of the occlusion of the small branches they can give rise to small small infarcts the millet gobler syndrome is a ventral pontine syndrome the basilar artery perforators and the median and paramedian origin these are the median and paramedian perforators what they cause is the seventh nerve palsy ipsilateral this is a fascicle of the seventh nerve ipsilateral abducens nerve fibers are also involved ipsilateral abducens nerve fibers are also involved contralateral hemiparesis because of the involvement of the corticospinal tract in the basis pontus you got a sixth nerve you got a seventh nerve and contralateral hemiparesis because of that real syndrome has in addition to that it is not because of the basilar artery perforators and uh, dorsal pons tegmentum is involved it also causes uh, let ipsilateral element 7 palsy because of the nucleus or the fascicles of cranial nerve 7 there is ipsilateral gaze paralysis because of nucleus abducens and contralateral hemiparesis corticospinal spinal tract so what is the difference here there is a gaze paralysis and nucleus the abducens nucleus also involved in a foveal syndrome and ventral pontine syndromes the paramedian perforators the six nerve palsy in contralateral hemiparesis because of the corticospinal tract in the basis pontus the merifoix is a base of the pons you see how much the pontus syndrome is there basal artery perforators ipsilateral cerebral ataxia because of pontus cerebral fibers 
contralateral hemiparesis cortico spinal tract in the boss and the contralateral impairment of pain and temperature sensations that is a meripoix syndrome now comes the medulla this is a medial lamniscus you can see this uh, medial part and the cortico spinal tract it is the ventral region the hypoglossal uh, nucleus uh, the tract is uh, nerve is exiting and you have ascending trigeminal thala uh, thalamic tract the spinal thalamic tract nucleus ambiguous descending trigeminal tract ascending trigeminal tract inferior cerebellar peduncle and a medial longitudinal fasciculus is seen this is hypoglossal nucleus this is a figure which a student should remember for replication and it is also divided into rostral medulla middle medulla and lateral medulla all the regions are depicted here and isolated degeneration and ataxia can occur because of the uh, involvement of a part of this which you can see here this in fact and that will cause the superior portion of the vestibular nuclei can give rise to isolated dizziness and ataxia you can see the type of lesion which you can see on the mri like this and these are the various types of infarcts we encounter in the medulla which you can see 32% or ventromedial ventral is 19% bilateral 2% and medial 42% so these are the type of infarcts which we see in the medulla and this is the diagram reference diagram which is present the wellenberg syndrome which we have discussed in number of times so uh, that is the lateral medulla you can see posterior inferior cerebellar artery ipsilaterally hemi ataxia because of the inferior cerebellar peduncle which will be present here dysphagia hoarseness ipsilateral parietal weakness because of nucleus ambiguous and hornner syndrome because of sympathetic fibers there is a decrease in pain and temperature sensation because of spinal tract and nucleus of the cranial of 5 and lateral spinal thalamic tract on the ipsilateral portion of the face and contralateral portion of the body the degeneration syndrome is a medial uh, medulla syndrome medial medulla vestibular artery perforators anterior spinal artery because contralateral hemiparesis because of medullary pyramid contralateral decrease in vibration of proprioception because of the medial lamniscus involvement and ipsilateral 12th nerve palsy because of the a uh, hypoglossal nerve involvement so this is a type of uh, neuroimaging we can come across in this so that's a important thing a medial medullary syndrome and the hypoglossal nucleus is present here and the nerve is exiting like this the medial lamniscus is here the fibers of hypoglossal nerve can be involved in this syndrome so that makes a diagnosis the screening to be done for hematological abnormalities like uh, cbp coagulation profile an extensive hematological workup including procoagulin profile anti cardiolipin antibody connective tissue profile this becomes more pertinent if there are no cardiac aortic cervical cranial lesions uh, detected the brain imaging posterior circulation is to be understood with some anatomical facts the circle of uh, willis is incomplete in about 60% and 50% the posterior commutative artery is hypoplastic or absent the cat scan of the brain and the draw back is a lot of skull artifacts so you cannot do a draw back is that you cannot uh, uh, no diagnose anything in the post circulation with a ct scan of the brain the best is mri brain and dwi uh, which may be normal initially in vbs stroke follow up studies often reveal infarcts which match the clinical presentation and importantly arterial spin labeling measures tissue perfusion using a uh, freely diffusible intrinsic factor the vascular imaging is very important ct with brain uh, ct with ct angiography mri brain with uh, diffusion weighted imaging mri dsa is a must so ct ct these are uh, useful for evaluating extracranial and intracranial post circulation and is very useful in evaluating the base structure how about mri it is useful to locate and assess the occlusion in the large arteries of the neck and intracranial lesions as i was mentioned here a quantitative mri is a new technique uh, this technique measures specific blood flow in extra intracranial vessel it is a flow analysis system that uses traditional mri to produce a 3d model of the vasculature and quantifies the 
vessel blood flow. Using QMRA, a subset of patients with symptomatic posterior cerebral disease and a low flow are identified for recurrent reconstructive surgery. MRA is 94% sensitive and 95% specificity. DSA or MRA are often used to study the posterior circulation. But those with the features of posterior cerebral artery disease, normal MRA and CTA, DSA is a must. DSA is better than CTA or MRA in defining lesions below 3 to 4 millimeters. So if uh, posterior circulation, lacrimal strokes and other things are less than 3 to 4 mm. Though DSA is considered as gold standard, however recent advances in the MR imaging techniques with a 7 Tesla machine which delineated posterior uh, uh, the arterial circulation very well and it may become gold standard. Sonology also helps us carotid Doppler studies of neck vessels, duplex sonography combined b mode. This modality is used to evaluate proximal vital artery to assess blood flow its direction. The transcranial Doppler studies are used uh, with occlusion intracranial vertebral artery or proximal best TCD has 70% uh, sensitivity and 98% specificity. There's something like mortality index which one should student should remember. There are Gosling index. It is a calculated flow parameter in ultrasound and it indicates the relationship between the blood flow in systolic pulse and final diastolic pulse. This Index is highly predictive of uh, early hemodynamic intracranial changes. In older males, the speed of intracranial blood flow increases and pulsatile C index increases. In females, the speed increases and the PI decreases. Uh, there are some cardiac investigations which are important that is ECG, ECO, Holter, and external internal loop because intrinsic sclerosis is a we say infarcts are embolic from heart artery to artery, so a thorough cardiac evaluation is mandatory in all the PCA infarcts. So this is the CT and neuroimaging, the post-process frontal and dorsal uh, CT images of the normal extracranial intracranial posterior circulation or V1 segment, V2 segment, V4 segment, basilar artery and posterior cerebral artery, which are very clear. The images show. Uh, all the segments on the branches. So the normal vertebral based art system, DTA, the cerebral angiography, the posterior inferior cerebral artery, anterior inferior cerebral artery, superior cerebral artery, posterior arteries, and the, this is the distal territory. This is the distal territory. This is the middle territory. This is the proximal territory. So we have considered same terms uh, territory wise in all these three areas. The investigation, the uh, CT, MRI, and they are uh, listed here, which is cranial vertebral artery, intracranial vertebral artery, basilar artery, posterior cerebral artery. CT is excellent, MRI is excellent, and ultrasound is slightly intracranial, performs less well. Doppler is also good. MR angiography, extracranial, it is bad, and all these are moderate. But angiography is good, except in artery, trans thoracic echocardiography, we may give a, some results 6% in posterior artery territory. And heart rhythm monitoring, that is the loop recorders, external loop recorders. If the timing recording is extended to three days, seven days, one month, three months, six months, you may. Uh, pick up the episode uh, atrial fibrillation. The posterior circulation, the MRI images are shown here and how the infarcts are seen and hypoplastic arteries which are going to take up in the fenestration of the basilar artery and uh, incomplete circle of the well is hypoplastic uh, right vertebral artery as can be seen. We will again uh, deal with uh, anomalies in the end and uh, these are the post circulation images, flare images and this is the infarct and this is the aneurysm which we seen in a case. So these are the uh, problems of patients admitted to emergency room in a coma with a basilar occlusion 
the uh, sleep perfusion showed a reduced cerebral blood volume and the medulla oblongata cerebellum midbrain and left thalamus look at the a skip core an increase in mean time transit and the b is the hyperperfused area and in the same region with a small mismatch uh, the adc is also seen here the c is the mr image so based on these findings secure recanalization therapy was not attempted because there is no mismatch the best artery occlusion on mri hyperacute ischemic uh, changes in the upper portion of the pons on diffusion weighted image and if it is not seen on flare image at the 6 hours you can really go ahead and do the thrombolytic therapy and you can see the vascular apoplastic angle of shows the occlusion of the mid basilar artery here so the treatment is general vasopressors and fluids are important because patients with intracranial vertebral artery occlusive disease are overtly sensitive to changes in the brain perfusion from decrease in blood volume or blood pressure these changes can be precipitated even by standing up or straining specifically there are no rcts for vertebral basilar artery disease that's the main problem the acd disease existing guidelines are extrapolated that means anti circulation disease whatever guidelines are there they are extrapolated to the posterior circulation disease also so they are incorrectly applied medical management heparin oral anticoagulation was the key in maintenance the thrombolytic therapy came for air recanalization with mechanical thrombectomy within 24 hours improves the survival and vertebral artery thrombosis there is ivtpa it will basilar artery occlusion a dsa and intraarterial therapy up to 12 to 24 hours so the basilar artery occlusion is a special category it is caused by intracranial proximal large vessel occlusion associated with high morbidity and mortality it presents with rapid onset of symptoms and signs of brainstem ischemia progressing rapidly to coma the effectiveness of endovascular therapy in these patients with stroke caused by occlusion has not been well studied the treatment strategies are mainly based on case series this is a basic study 2009 uh, in 2010 uh, this study helped in the stent retrieval system uh, has been introduced for thrombectomy in basilar occlusion cases this study was done by shoneville et al in this best not interventional cooperative study 592 patients were recruited it's a large case series where partial or complete recanalization was seen with these efforts in 72%. Two issues are important to consider. TIAs and minor strokes antedate acute basilar artery occlusion and treatment is required at this stage identify symptoms. Second issue in this study is poor definition of onset of occlusion and delay in intraarterial therapy because once the TIAs are sets in very fast this is there is got a tall study who have 15 studies uh, covering about 312 subjects with the thrombectomy between 2010 and 2014 they noted that recanalization rate is 81 percent and favorable outcomes and 42 percent mortality 30 percent ICH and 4 percent latest this is a baseline at occlusion study basics 021 which is a multi-center open label international randomized control trial with blinded outcome assessment 300 patients signed within six hours after the estimated time of onset of a stroke due to basal artery occlusion in a one is to one ratio to receive endovascular therapy or standard medical care the primary outcome was a favorable functional outcome a score of zero to three at 90 days endovascular therapy medical therapy were not significantly different with respect to a favorable functional outcome unfortunately in this 2021 basic study the surgery there is a 2.5 times higher mortality in circulation disease than anticirculation disease hence the surgery is an important aspect 
it's observed that in failed medical therapy on critically ill patients the outcomes of surgery are better so posterior cerebral artery reconstructive surgery that is extrapolated from the ec ic bypass surgery for the anterior circulation it was started after the uh, clear uh, delineation of anterior and posterior circulation by dsa in 1980s so surgery for extracranial vertebral artery disease provided a complete resolution of symptoms in 96 to 100% very good achievement digital vertebral business system occlusion responded to bypass when they were stable after failed medical treatment the revascularization procedures which are in vogue for vertebral artery origin stenosis there is transposition of the extracranial vertebral artery to carotid artery the vertebral artery stenosis at v3 bypass distal segment v3 at v3 v4 segment axial artery to pica bypass or radial artery graft intracranial vertebral artery based on stenosis there is superior temporal artery to sca pca bypass the bypass problem cd and v by genus group disorders the groups having better prognosis outcome is dependent on the severity of the neurological signs and the presence of absence of arterial lesions the location and extent of the infarction and mechanism of ischemia the immediate mortality rate in pc stroke is uh, about 3 to 4% but the major disability is 18% in the nemc pcr registry the embolic occlusions that are short and involve the proximal basilar artery with good collateral arteries are most likely to recanalize and have a good functional outcome patients who are comatose or tetraplegic or chronic small vessel vessel disease have a poor or severe multifocal disease most often has benign course with the multiple tias and very few strokes so vbi imaged with 1.5 tesla mra showed a 45 percent risk of recurrent stroke in 90 days after the ictus if there is stenosis so the poor outcome irrespective of age underlying infection is seen in following situations if there is a cardiac embolism basilar artery involvement basilar artery occlusion carries a high risk of disability and death so efforts are to be made to identify this lesion expeditiously and because and some third factor poor is involvement of multiple intracranial territories that means the prevention more of the coagulation antiplatelet agents in patients with intracranial stenosis warfarin is superior to antiplatelet agents but is associated with bleeding complications the intracranial stenosis is often treated for three months with dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with large vessel occlusions and stenosis antiplatelet agents for very severe large artery flow limiting stenosis and dissections anticoagulant medications are considered to prevent distal embolization and vertebral angioplasty and stenting for vertebral artery occlusion or in the wall so lastly we will go into the anomalies of the posterior circulation and these are frequent and they are asymptomatic asymmetric vertebral arteries are seen in 65 percent incomplete circular embolies and tips and persistent trigeminal artery commonest anomaly which will uh, bypass which will connect the vertebral carotid artery with the vertebral basilar system and fenestration of vertebral basilar junction the predigestion to see aneurysm formation persistent hypoglossal artery the artery of percheron which i mentioned earlier fetal origin of one or both becomes which origin from the carotid labyrinthine artery which usually arises from the basilar artery instead arises from the anterior inferior cerebral artery you can see the persistent the trigeminal artery which is from carotid circulation is an important source of blood supply to the hind brain in the embryonic stage but it may persist it may cause the tau sign uh, which represents the appearance of a persistent primitive trigeminal artery on the sagittal plane of angiogram or a sagittal mri images and it resembles the greek letter tau and is equivalent to the modern day t in the latin so this is a hypoplastic basilar artery hypoplastic vertebral arteries and this is a persistent uh, trigeminal artery fenestration of the basilar, basilar artery which you can see the fenestration of the basilar artery 
and this is the finished finished segment which is seen here uh, persistent hyperglossal artery you can see the persistent hyperglossal artery here and uh, it's a rare carotid basilar anastomosis with a reported angiographic uh, prevalence of up to 0.09 percent it usually arises from the internal carotid artery between c1 and c3 levels whereas uh, rarely it may come from the carotid artery also you can see the persistent trigeminal artery here uh, in, in uh, the it a territorial infarct uh, if there are territorial infarcts uh, that involve the left carotid and vertebral basilar territories uh, then we have to think of uh, this anastomosis so this case highlights that such a persistent anastomosis should be considered when multiple infarcts involve the anterior and posterior territories are encountered should be kept in mind when dealing with carotid thrust or not lesions so uh, you can see that when multiple infarcts involving anterior and posterior territories are encountered one should keep in mind the persistent hypoglossal artery the anomalies of posterior circulation also include hypoplastic right vertebral artery bottom arrow basically displacement this is a displacement to the dominant vertebral artery top arrow. uh there is an incomplete circle of willis the absent left posterior artery here this this one this area and of course absent left a1 segment there is a top this is the one and the fenestration which we have seen here on the basilar artery <coughs> hypoplastic right p1 segment also is visible here posterior cervical artery present directly from the internal carotid artery the feet variant of uh, which you can see the posterior cervical artery uh, directly arises from the internal carotid this is the internal carotid artery this is the fetal pca you can call the flare uh, right lateral medullary infarction in the 32 year old woman with a hypoplastic right vertebral artery means in more than 6 hours of the onset the catheter angiogram of this lady this another 55 year old shows uh, an atherosclerosis of the vertebral basilar junction here that is the stenotic which is which can be stented and see it, it shows the posterior territory in fact and steer man with fibrillation the dsa shows dissecting with intraluminal thrombus in a 19 year old boy presenting with vertigo attacks right cerebral infarction the artery of percheron is an abnormal variant of the arterial supply of the thalamus it is a uh, occlusion can lead to bilateral thalamic and rostral midbrain infarcts presenting uh, as memory loss fluctuating levels of consciousness altered mental states structures affected are the intra laminar nuclei of the thalamus in the brain stem reticular activating system the memory impairment is because of medio dorsal and anterior nucleus of the thalamus amygdala hippocampus and mammillary bodies are involved the behavioral changes are medio dorsal and anterior nucleus of the thalamus the cingulate gyrus amygdala limbic system frontal lobe involvement the psychosis is medio dorsal interlaminal anterior nucleus of the thalamus mammillary bodies and cingulate gyrus aphasia because medio let medio dorsal and interlaminal nuclei frontal lobe and dorsal of the basal ganglia dysarthria is frontal lobes basal ganglia cerebellum in pop ocular motor maltis because of rostral midbrain ocular motor nucleus dorsal interstitial nucleus of calam medial longitudinal fasciculus and frontal eye fields so there is a vertical gaze palsy there may be intralaminal nuclear clamor which may get involved causing cerebellar fields also because the involvement of dentator rubra thalamocortical tract this is the art of percheron in fact which you can see in bilateral thalamus and the art of percheron the pca you can see this normal it can come like this it can come like it come like this so there are types type 2a and these types type 1 is normal anatomy type 2 is both paramedian arteries originate from the left p1 segment and uh, c is type 2b this is a type 2b uh, which the aop originates in a laterally from p1 segment and then bifurcates up in the bilateral paramedian thalamus rostral midbrain type 3 which you can see here is 
the inner artery arcade that is connecting both the posterior cerebral arteries the water connects the left and right p1 segments gives rise to paramedian so these are the types of arteries of uh, parishan and uh, these are the uh, infarcts you can see the thalamic vein infarcts in this case and uh, this is the artery of parishan which is supplying bilateral you can see that singhang so the fetal law uh, thing occipital strokes are associated with ipsilateral fetal pca is also associated with coexistent carotid occlusal disease the fetal pca is originated from the carotid artery ipsilateral fetal carotid artery does lack the capacity to develop uh, leptomeningeal anastomosis between aca mca and pca because collaterals have not developed the vertebral artery may have some anomalies like a left uh, optic is dominant in 70% non dominant vertebral artery may end in pica so vertebral artery hypoplasia is associated with pca stroke and infarcts commonly occur in the ipsilateral to hypoplastic vessel the asymmetry is defined as internal vessel diameter of 1 to 2 and it is associated with pontin infarcts they are 100% more than in cases where the vertebral arteries are symmetric and so that's a very important point to note in the uh, vertebral artery strokes uh, the basilar artery can have a curvature and it probably results from the congenital asymmetric blood flow to the vertebro basilar junction which causes asymmetric vessel wall tension displacement and elongation the inner wall shear stress here promotes torsion of the pontine perforating arteries and thrombosis the relation between vih and ba curvature and stroke risk laterality is very well established that is associated with 69 to 75% pontine or pica territory in forms that means vertebral artery hypoplasia basilar artery curvature there is an increased stroke risk ipsilateral to these abnormalities so that finishes the talk and i have the literature which uh, helped me in uh, compiling this talk uh, this talk despite uh, we have a lot of cases which were analyzing the posterior circulation strokes as a preliminary we reviewed the literature these are the recent articles by mark Spar uh, sparko posterior circulation ischemic stroke anatomy etiology into presentations imaging acute treatment and the uh, syndromes diagnosis and management by Ursula, which is a JN, the BMJ article of uh, JNNP, and there's the New England Medical Center Registry of Kaplan, and the pathophysiology and diagnosis of uh, VB insufficiency with a review of literature, which is uh, the <clears throat> which is the auto laryngology archives, the NEJM current concepts of vertebral basilar disease review article, the surgical neurovascular intervention. Uh, uh, article review article on the review of the diagnosis and management of vertebral basal circulation disease and the frontiers in neurology article of ischemic posterior circulation stroke a review of anatomy clinical presentations diagnosis and current management and of course the list of the basics uh, study of NEJM of uh, May 2021 which is a very important uh, uh, article as far as because the first randomized controlled trial of uh, this uh, particular intervention unfortunately did not yield any result so these are the references for this talk uh, i uh, have uh, tried to put together all the various references latest advances in the vertebral basilar stroke and we defined a chronic vertebral basilar tendency which will give rise to non-specific symptoms which we should be able to identify and say that it may preclude to the vertebral basilar which can be much more disastrous so appropriate interventions have to be planned so thank you very much for your intervention your attention and we'll meet in the next talk of some time till that time and i say bye bye to all the listeners and if you have any doubts you can contact me on my email as gorthi at gmail.com all right thank you very much i end the presentation here